Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name is Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. I'm in my home today with my friend Priscilla Pearson. So this is going to be a different episode than pretty much any episode that we've done before. Um, I actually interviewed Priscilla way back when I first started the podcast. She was number 10. So if you want to look for her number 10 story, it will be different than what we talk about today. It will. She'll talk about a couple of things that were that she included in that first episode with her. But for the most part today, we're going to be talking about the placement program, the the Indian placement program. I have, what's the exact title of that, Priscilla? Just the Indian placement program. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we're going to be talking about that. And um, but first, let me have Priscilla introdu- introduce herself in her tribal way. Um, she speaks Navajo fluently. Um, well, she just made f- funny faces <laughs> and said maybe not fluently, but Do she understands Navajo fluently. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Okay, so Priscilla, you go first. Okay, yeah, take us and share your personal and bitsui and share. Um, can we join that? No, sha. Ah, 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 she hot eight out on that quin quid a um salt lake the whole yeah, he gives you a whole a a store a quit a um. Twitch eaten in slow, but a nebusish chain. Senna Jenny doesn't say Ado and the Bethlehem and Dushna led that eh. Oh, what are the next son in Schle? Okay. Uh, do you want to tell us in English what you said? Uh, I just gave my tribal references, is basically what I did. So. Okay. So if you want to hear that translated in English, go back to episode number 10. <laughs> yes. It will be there. <laughs> okay, so um, Priscilla and I have become dear friends in the past few years because of that initial meeting in 2021. So, um, and she's often told me, she's like, I wish I would have talked more about the placement program. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Where would you like to start with this this story, Priscilla? I guess it's basically my um, personal story and it's my experiences as an Indian placement student. I'd like to start with my grandfather and grandmother. My grandfather was named Charlie Bitsui and my grandmother was named Maggie Bitsui. They lived first in Zuni, New Mexico and later on in, in life they moved down to Manilito Canyon, which is um, where they resided and where I came into the picture. My grandparents had a total of nine children, five boys and four girls. And I am a granddaughter of Maggie and Mary, or Maggie and Charlie, sorry, Charlie and Maggie Bitsui. They were both silversmiths. They were, they were very successful in um, cattle raising, we, we just had so many different experiences um, in Manuelito. My grandfather was a branch president back in the 19, 1970s or 69. No, actually, it was 1967. I do apologize. He was a branch president. We used to go to the um, Two Wells branch which used to be in Sageltra but two wells New Mexico which is closer in the vicinity in the same area. I remember grandpa um, when he heard of the Indian placement program that he called us all together as a family his children and his grandchildren and at that point in time he had heard from the President Kimball and the presidency of the church that they were going to start the Indian placement program and that we were encouraged to participate. But my grandfather 
somehow with great faith, without any question, was obedient to following the prophet and submitting his prosperity into going on the Indian placement program. Not only did several of his children go on the placement program, but his grandchildren, which I am, also went on the placement program. At that point in time, that was what I recall as uh, an eight-year-old girl, six boys, only girl, leaving a family and heading up to Salt Lake to um, be on the Indian placement program to participate in that. I recall asking Grandpa why he was sending all of us, because this is during August and September. Those are the times where the harvesting of everything took place. And we as children, we had tons of, we were the life, we helped our grandparents a lot in maintaining the home and taking care of the cattle and the sheep and all the various different animals that we had, along with crops. We had fills of crops that we had to harvest. And we knew that that was the, around the time that we needed to to depart, to come up here to Salt Lake. So I remember we were asking as to why he would send us out because they needed help. And we were like, Grandpa, how are you guys going to do it? And he says, I have children. <laughs> and so I guess my parents and his, his children, uh, the adult people, had to step up and participate there. But my grandfather was a very strong um, leader in his own sense of the word. He led us and he had the faith, a testimony of the gospel, that he sent all his prosperity um, onto the placement program. So when I left at eight years old, going to the stake center and loading into the trailways bus, I remember our suitcases and how we had to have them and, and get ready to go. But they would always take us in the evening time so that we could travel at night. And I'm sure some of you can relate to this. As we get on the bus and as we head on out, we get into Salt Lake early morning to where we get to a stake center. And there we are able to get checked physically and um, to make sure that we're healthy and strong and also a time where we get to meet and be picked up by our foster parents. I recall the first year that I went, I um, came and I didn't have a foster family when I first came. However, my caseworker at that point in time took me in and I stayed with him for four years, him and his family. I don't know if any of you remember Lawrence Green. He was a caseworker that um, took care of a lot of the Native students down in the Gallup area and the Navajo Reservation area. Anyway, I lived with him for four years out in Sugar House. And then from there, I went to a different family. So that would probably put me at fourth or fifth grade. Um, and at junior high, I went to a different family. Um, but let me go back to when brother, um, when I was living with the Greens, I had the opportunity of learning right off the bat how to be, I'd never seen a handicapped individual in my life. And yet I learned service and compassion right off the bat. Because we, as a family, we all had to work and help with my brother, getting him ready for work or for school and just knowing how to care for him because was he wasn't his, able what to. What was his handicap? I think he had multiple sclerosis and he, he just wasn't able to physically move around and, and stuff like that. And so right off the bat, I learned how to be a service and I've never seen anybody that needed such care in my life. So that was a good learning experience. Was he there. older than you? or younger? He was younger than I was. And he wore braces and, and different things that we had to kind of work with him. I think he, it was the beginning, beginning of that. And so 
I learned compassion at that point in time. And I loved my family. Uh, we were a family of three at that point in time. There was my older sister, April, and then there was myself, and then there was um, Brooke. How was your um, transition from the res to this family in in a city area? That is quite interesting that you would ask, because I recall getting into to the Greens' home, and I would sit there and flip the lights and flush the toilets and because we never had that when we were, we were down on the res so it was really quite exciting and and really a, a different sight for me but um it was actually a very pleasant um experience because the fact that I knew um our caseworker prior to coming onto the program I knew him but I did not know his family but that he he let me come into his family and and live with them. I think that I think that ch- shows a lot of um, love and respect in their own way of doing what the prophets had asked them as well. I think it's a two sided coin because as Native Americans having the opportunity to come to the placement program and yet the faithful saints here in Salt Lake were able to invite us in and I just think they had a testimony the gospel they knew the plan and they wanted to help and so that that's why they did what they did I I find that so awesome because even when we have an opportunity like a school sends an announcement saying hey we have a placement pro a plate not a placement we have a an exchange student coming from Germany or wherever. If you have an extra ho- bedroom, I'm always like, not me, not me. <laughs> <laughs> but but so many saints open yes. their homes to yes. sometimes even more than one kid. Right, right. And so my experience for that first home family life was very good. I had a p- very pleasant family. They they loved the gospel and um lived across the street from the school so but i was always late for for school but nevertheless <laughs> we why were you work. always late for school i don't know i just figured it's just across the street <laughs> <laughs> and so i was always tardy but anyway but i got to go home for lunch every day you can you know how many kids can say that but to sit with your foster mom and, and your brothers and sisters and be there in the home setting it was beautiful and then when i turned sixth grade I went out to another family who were Kent and Winnie Harward they had three boys and two girls and um, at that point in time I didn't know exactly um, what to expect because I've never I didn't know this family so this was the first time but this family is was a very loving family. The only reason why I, I found out that I went to that family, and it's probably not the only true reason, but my sister, my foster sister wanted a sister. And so I was the one that um, she chose. And she told me, she says, I had a whole book of photos of these children, girls that were on the placement program. And she said, and I picked your photo. And I thought, how cool was that? I didn't know, you know, um, but how how blessed I was because I was able to be her sister. However, on the downside of that, I got along with my foster brothers a lot more because I had six brothers (laughs) prior to coming on the placement program. So I recall my foster mom sending us sitting down with me one time. She says, can you just play with your sister for a little while? Because I didn't play a lot of dolls. (laughs) I didn't play, you know, inside type thingy. I was always out running around with the boys, you know, doing things. And so that was quite a transition. But it was a beautiful experience. It just a very loving family. And um, the cool thing about it is my foster mother's sister had been a missionary and had been with my family prior to um, going and living with her, her family. I was, I went home one summer and I was going through a box of, um, 
that my parents had in their house, a shoebox. And I was just going through and I saw this picture of a postcard type picture. And I says, oh my goodness, that's my aunt Marilyn, who happened to be Winnie, Winifred's sister. And I asked my parents, I says, Dich reit, eh? and they told me that it was a sister, a sister missionary. And I said, do you know that this lady here on this postcard is my foster mom's sister? What a cool, cool that coincidence. Cool. And I think a lot of times I think that was Heavenly Father telling me that he was aware of where I was and what was happening in my life. And so I was just so, I love that family. The Madsen family was a family of love unconditionally. They did not have stipulations. They didn't have um, any of that. We were um, a family of, my foster parents would always sit me down sometimes and say, remember the choices you make, because if you make the wrong choice, you'll know, and then you'll have to change it. But just remember that we trust you in whatever choices you make, you will learn from it. And it wasn't more of more of that kind of gentle, soft love that they taught me the gospel. And as I went about through high school, um, that was in Rose Park, I went to West High School. And then my foster parents decided they were going to move out to Sandy. So I ended up moving out to Sandy. But when I did that, I went from high school to back to junior high. That was the time period where I was still a ninth grader. But at West High School, ninth graders were going to school then. But I had to go back to Eastmont Junior High, which wasn't fun. But it was a new place, a new area, and I still got to be with them. So that was that was a blessing for me that I didn't have to be switched out to another family. And so I went with them there and, of course, graduated from there. And the cool thing about it is um, they had so much love. I had aunts and uncles that uh, serve various missions. But I'd like to talk about my grandpa Madsen. He was always a temple going um, individual as a foster grandpa. He would sit in his Spanish style house by the window reading his scriptures and every morning he would be at the temple, Jordan River Temple doing his ordinance work. We could always know he would always be upset because everybody um the stores wouldn't be open by the time he got back and he's like why did everybody sleep in until such and such they don't they know they should be up and going about and so he was a baker he was danish and oh boy he, the food that they could cook over at their house and that was kind of a, a neat thing they really had a family unit that that um they just loved each other brothers and sisters got along um cousins we as cousins were always together in that setting and uh yeah but going back to um in the summertime going back home was also something that was very um important to my grandfather when we came home he reminded us of who we were as a navajo as a Diné people he ta retaught us always our language this is how you talk in Navajo. This is how we how we live. Don't forget who you are. But I more importantly, I do believe that he was saying, you are a child of God. Remember that always in your heritage. And we know that to be because of how we read the Book of Mormon nowadays and know that um, this is part of our lineage, that we're the children of Lehi. I just I just think that that's so beautiful. He never gave up on the gospel just to think the faith that he had to send his whole prosperity on the place my program is fascinating. Not only did it was for his grandkids, but his his great grandkids were also able to participate in the Indian placement program. Do you know how many of your family went on the program? I can't really say because there's like six my immediate family and then there's oh let's see maybe 14 15 there's there was a good amount we were a big family we were not a, a, a small family at all because my grandparents had what did I say eight eight kids so they had children and you know the family just continues to get um, bigger 
but my cousins were also um, up here on the placement program too. Um, so that is, that is so fascinating that that would happen. And then another thing that I'd like to bring up, which is really cool, is that um, I have an 18-year-old boy right now, and one of his sons is, um, one of his friends, I'm sorry, one of his friends was a grandson to one of the missionaries that served in our area. His name is Nephi Kenneth Mueller. And he, back in those days, I guess, as a missionary, they, they, they did splits. They took his companion and they told him to find somebody who would help him in, in the area that he was at. And so he kept asking people around. He was in Vanderwagen at that point in time. And everybody kept telling him, go down to the Manilito Canyon. That's where the Bitsuis live. They have tons of boys. I'm sure one of them <laughs> would be able to be your, help you in your missionary endeavors. And so he did come down. And uh, he found my Uncle Ernie. Um, and my Uncle Ernie was blind. But my Uncle Ernie was more than willing to go out and teach the gospel with him. He loved the gospel. My Uncle Ernie was a branch president as well at the age of 21 at Fort Wingate. And so that was another branch. So my grandfather was always very active in the, in the gospel itself. And so anyway, I'm one of my son's his friend, he says, is this is his last name happened to be Kenneth Miller. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I wonder, I wonder. And so then I asked him, says, did your grandfather or your father ever serve a mission down in the Southwest Mission? And they, they're like, and he's like, I don't know. <laughs> you know teenagers. He's a teenager. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he ended up, um, I, I, he ended up telling me that that was his grandfather. And again, again, Heavenly Father is checking in saying, I know where you are, Priscilla. I know what is going on. I know you're at the right place. You're doing the right thing. And so I went and talked with um, Brother Kenneth Miller. And he told me that my uncle doing helping him, he ended up going to a missionary conference in Holbrook with him where President Kimball ended up um, saying, President Ken, or brother Elder Kenneth Miller, who's your par, companion here, and he's like he's not a he's not a missionary. He's just helping me in my area right now. And President Kimball says, um, "Let's set him apart as a missionary." <laughs> and then um, he asked again, President or Elder Kenneth Miller, President uh, Kimball asked him, "Does he have a patriarchal blessing?" So they set him apart a, a as a missionary that day at that elders or that mission conference in Holbrook. And also he got his patriarchal blessing that day that he, they were able to find a patriarch to have that all taken care of. And um, as my, as I was able to sit down with elder Kenneth Miller, he was telling me about how, my uncle was always bringing people in. He, he just had this, even though he was blind and disability in that, in that area, he wasn't born blind. They were playing with fireworks as a young kid and the fireworks ended up um, getting him in the eye. And so he lost his sight in that, in that fashion, which is kind of sad, but yet at the same time, you don't know why things happen, but how cool is that to, to think that, Heavenly Father always knows where you are. And many times has that happened to where I have a strong testimony and I'm so grateful for the placement program and how it has blessed my family as we continue in the gospel. Um, I just, there's really no words that can say what a vision my grandfather had. And here we are still continuing to go strong and be faithful. I think I've been a member of the church 50 some odd years now since, and I've been faithful in, in the gospel. I've worked in temples. I've taught Sunday school, Relief Society, state president, or not, not state president, um, Relief Society, and also a stake 
young women's leader and various different teachings of callings that I've had the opportunity of participating in. And uh, I just, I don't know where I would be without the gospel. The gospel is my main core, um, the foundation of the Savior himself, the, the foundation of the prophets, the foundation of the scriptures, the foundation of just doing and keeping covenants with my Heavenly Father that enabled me to be who I am today as a daughter of Heavenly Father. And I, I have been thinking about, well, I already have a, a, on Facebook, but I haven't opened it up to everybody quite yet. I was telling Andrea about this, that I have a Facebook that I'm going to open up. It's called Unified Members of the Indian Placement Program Program of Various Tribes. Um, that, I think, would be great for those who have been on the placement program. I know tons of people who have been on, and I've heard of their experiences. Some are good, some are bad, and some are, us. Oh, it was all right, you know, kind of a thing. So it's kind of exciting to put that out there. I'd like to find a, a, a way to be able to um, gather, gather the Indian placement students. And even though we are up in age, we still, we still are around. And I think we still have a lot of healing and a lot of hope and love in the gospel that we can share and unify and gather together as saints to help bring others into the gospel even more strongly. And so I, I, I feel that to be true. And, um, um, what, as you understand it, what was the purpose of placement program or purposes? I think the purpose of the program, we know that we're told that the prophets of the church, um, there's a scripture that, that comes to mind where heavenly father would not let things happen if they were not meant to be, do you know that he would never mislead his people. And I think through the prophets, them listening, I, from, you know, in the sense that uh, there is purpose for it. And the church is true for the whole, we're worldwide now. We're not just in Utah, New Mexico, the Four Corners area. We're a much more broader throughout the United States, but also in other countries now. And so it, it's exciting that uh, I always find it funny because I've listened to some podcasts where they say, you never can go anywhere. You'll find a Navajo in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and so and that's so true because we're all over the place. We're studying, we're, we're moving on with life and, and enjoying this life that we were meant to be. I often think if I stayed on the reservation and if I didn't have the opportunity of being on the placement program, I don't believe that I would be alive. I believe that I may have turned to alcoholism, which is very, you know, prevalent in, in the tribe. Um, I don't know if I would have gotten an education because at that point in time, it was more of grandparents needed help. And so there was a lot of sacrifice that was made prior to, because I know my parents had to stay home and take care of the home front with their parents. But yet my grandfather was willing to let us spread our wings and fly. And that was such a beautiful blessing to send forth to your, set forth for your posterity. So. Yeah. So some of the things that I understand were purposes of, the placement program were that children could could get a good education, whereas at the time a lot of tribes didn't have good schools. Right, and I also experienced um, boarding school prior to coming up on you the did? placement program. Yes, and that was a frightening experience. I don't choose to remember because it was quite. I went to Fort Wingate. Um, I didn't know boarding that about school you. there and so you must have been so tiny yeah I was I, I I mean that's a long time ago but that was my first experience in in being in boarding school and it was rough it was run like a military type thing where you would you had a rigid schedule and I remember being on the tump bunk in one of my dorms and you know those it was a speaker 
But to me, as in my head as a little child, I sat there and I thought, they're watching me through those little holes. I know oh, somebody's no. watching me. So it, it was frightening, you know, because it's dark. But there's a whole bunch of kids that are in the hall. You know, we got double bunks and stuff like that. But to me, it was really frightening because when we had the fire drills, that that was right there by my bed. And oh my we gosh. had to take those <gasps> army wool blankets and run out and stand out in the cold or whatever. I don't know if it was really, I don't can't recall i remember doing a few f fire drills but um but yeah we'd stay there um for the year some some so the contrast between boarding school and what you experience day and night, night and day and you know and the opportunity that of, of is available to those that participated on the placement program that the the eye it's like your eyes are wide open. They're more open to what's available to you. And you, you're you not only just centered on being restricted to your the reservation and to, to that um, mediocrity to where you just, you know, this is what I'm supposed to be and this is just what life is meant to be. But yet we had the opportunity to come on the placement program to be able to open to a lot more experiences yes and the ability that we have to be able to experience life in general i wouldn't have gone to mexico um to taiwan to tijuana and um <laughs> i have to tell you this really quick i went I'm with my foster parents the harvards we went down to california we went to san diego and wax museum and all that stuff and then they decided one day we're going to go to tijuana so we just kind of went across not thinking anything about it played around did our thing in tijuana turned around to come back into the um back to the united states and here I am with a family full of blondes and blue eyes. And here I am, a little Mexican looking girl. And they're looking at me like, who's she with? Why is she with you? And my foster mom and dad are like, she's our, she's our foster child. She's our child. No. And we didn't even think about getting, no. you know, a passport or because birth certificate. Because at that point, or, you were just family. Yeah, we were just family. And that's how they looked at me as just another child with them. And so anyway, at that point in time, I'm like, oh oh no, what's going to happen to me? And so then my foster mom, she's Navajo, she's Navajo. She knows how to speak Navajo. And then a booth over was a clerk that knew how to speak Navajo. <laughs> and so there again, Heavenly Father comes and answers another prayer for me. And this guy comes over and he starts talking to me in Navajo. I think Grandpa Charlie knew this. I think Grandpa Bitsui knew that one day Priscilla is going to run into <laughs> not have, having to speak her language to get back into the United States. Um, but um, he ended up talking to me in Navajo, and I answered him back, and he's, and he's like, she's not Spanish. She's Navajo. Send her through. <laughs> but, I mean, what an answer to prayers that was, too. You know, so many, co it's not coincidence, it's miracles. I, I it's a miracle from Heavenly Father knowing that he was always have always been there as a little child I could always have in my head I always knew there was a God in heaven I I just knew that it's always been with me all my life and so that's one of the gifts that I was blessed with when I came down here to earth but yeah that was a funny one yeah <laughs> so when you finished high school did you continue these relationships with the foster family and yes. was it just did you continue with one family or both families actually I did with both families um uh brother green Lawrence Green is still alive and lives out in West Jordan by me and then the Harwards um live down in St. George and so they're there I still get along with my siblings I do have I do have one more family I forgot to mention because somehow in my senior year, I decided that I wanted to go to um, see the greener side of life. And so my, I told my foster parents that I wanted a new family my last year because I wanted to know what it was like to live with somebody else. Well, I did. I moved with a different family my last year. I don't know what I was thinking, <laughs> but it's a good thing that I did. And it's bizarre. Um, he was, it was the, uh, Charlene and Bill Bush, they lived out in Sandy and they had a house full of girls. 
see, I played basketball with them in uh, like uh, young women's and stuff like that. And so I wanted to be a part of their family because I thought, oh, a house full of girls, that could be kind of fun. And so I decided I was going to do that. Well, it didn't turn out to be as fun as I thought it would thought it would be because they were more. And this is interesting that I that you that I finally bring this out. They were more the letter of the law. He was a state president. And it was, you do this, you do that, you act this way, you do this, you do that. Check these points. Yeah, check these points. I remember one time, and I guess there are some points to the placement program that I kind of under can understand why people have such hard feelings about. Because one time I was going to a basketball or a football game, I can't remember one or the other, and I was borrowing my foster mom the car. And I didn't know this beforehand, but she put down the odometer reading she had written it down and so I went and took my friends and I um we went to the football game and then I dropped a few of them off and then I came home and she called me in and she said this was the the beginning of the reading and this was the end of the reading and so I want to know where we where you went and why 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 the numbers are as they are and at that point in time I learned just like we do with the gospel. I mean, nobody is perfect in the gospel. I understand that. Okay. But we all do our best to raise our kids the way that we should see my other family. They trusted me. They, they, they just said, you're on your own. You do free will and like this savior, you know, you learn as you go along. But this second family was a little more different to where I had to prove myself to be worthy enough to have their trust and so I can kind of understand when some people say my foster parents didn't like me they didn't trust me this I do understand that part but yet at the same time had I not gone to their house it was in their home that I knelt down in their family room after reading the book of Mormon because that's what we did and I asked if the book of Mormon was true there in that point in time in their house, I got a testimony of the gospel of, of the Book of Mormon, the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. The Spirit bore witness to me at that point in time. Had I not done that, I don't know when I would have gotten it. So from that point on, that was a blessing to me um, to see the different sides of the coins. There's the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, right? And so from that point on but the funny thing about it is after I graduated I came back to the Harwards and they ended up um I ended up going on a mission uh from their from their from their home they always had an open door for me all the time and so I I didn't question I could show up there anytime so but uh I ended up going on a mission and then coming back home to them so it continues. I, I have great love for my brothers and my sisters of, of both. The gospel is true. It doesn't matter. We're all children of our Heavenly Father, and he loves each and every one of us. This is just my story. This is just how it is with me and how I've been able to be contis- continue to be a valiant servant of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So another purpose that I think the placement program was to show that, to show people how living the gospel brings happiness and safety and everything. And you, through these stories, have shown that you were a successful yes. story in yes. that yes. in that regard. Very much so. Yes, I really truly have a testimony of the prophets and how they're led and guided and leaded, led leaded <laughs> led um as like as being the head of the ch- the church is is so beautiful even president nelson he says that you need to have your own testimony you have to know how to receive revelation you have to think celestial you know all that kind of stuff is true we have covenants that we've made throughout our life and to be honorable to be able to say yes i'm i'm worthy to to be in front of my Heavenly Father and my Savior, Jesus Christ, one day. It's just, it's a beautiful story. Is there anything else that you want to talk about that we didn't get to yet? Um, no, 
I, I'm, I'm grateful for the placement program. And I'd love to meet up with other students because I've, I know I've had lots of friends that, that enjoyed the placement program. And we kind of grew as a riding the bus back and forth for so many years. You, you have friendships along the way. You build them and you're just like, here we go again. Or yeah, here, you know, this and that. And, and we go to different schools, high schools and whatnot. And we may have played each other throughout the year in sports and we might see each other at sports or, you know, hey, hey, you know, and, and different things like that. I just am, it, 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 it was very beautiful. It was, it was a beautiful experience for me and I do treasure that. So yeah. Okay. Since this is a little bit different episode, I'm going to ask Priscilla to end this a little bit differently. Um, Usually I ask you, what does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? But I just want, I know you've been, been doing this throughout, but I want you to bear your testimony of, of your identity and, um, your relationship with your father in heaven and your savior, Jesus Christ. Because that is what is the tribe that binds us all together. Absolutely. That's the main core. And that's what should run inside of us. Every fiber of my being that I am today is because of the strength of the gospel, the teachings of the gospel, all the experiences that I had as developing who I am as a daughter of Heavenly Father. Um being obedient, keeping the commandments, paying tithing. You know, we we think that those are hardships. But the thing that I think a lot about is the Savior paid the price for us. He didn't have to. He didn't have to do that. And yes, everybody says, well, he was perfect. That was part of his his mission. Heavenly Father sent him down, um, and he was perfect in every sense of the word. And therefore how how can you relate to such a being and i think to myself how grateful i am and how loved i am as an individual because we're going to face heavenly father and jesus christ and all these apostles and all these book of mormon prophets and you know all we're going to be at the judgment seat one day And we're going to have to explain how we know, how we've come to know who they are personally. Just as we, just like you and I, Andrea, we know each, we've come to know each other and we, we feel that spirit that we have the kinship and the, and, and what we have between us is strong. I can't imagine what the relationship feels like with our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. We make it that if we are obedient and if we obey and if we have faith. Yes, God is all-knowing. God is all. He He's created everything. This spring, I was looking at a flower that happened to be growing in my flower bed. And I was looking directly at it, and I could see the beautiful hues of colors. I could see the seed from inside, the pollinates, the, the bees love to get at. Just to think how delicate that flower was and how, what a cre <sighs> Heavenly Father is brilliant. How many of us drive past flowers and don't even look at what, what, you know, you go in your neighborhood and everybody's got pretty flowers. Oh, that looks so nice and this and that. But if you really look close and up personal, you can see the delicate, I mean, those petals are thin on some of those and the colors the different variety of colors and how they can repollinate themselves you know the perennials you can do that with to where they just continue to grow on and I think this master of ours that we call heavenly father is a genius his gifts his how would I say it his blood his being he created us he created us we're all different and unique in our own way but yet we're so individually different just as that flower is different from a different flower that comes from the same plant and it's beautiful to think that he cares enough for us 
that he made this beautiful world for us to live in if we just kind of look around. I think as Native people, we really do um, appreciate Mother Earth and, and what she provides for us. More on a, a spiritual level, he created this world for us. He's given us this opportunity to have this experience of knowing pain, love, joy, happiness, sorrow. You know, the list goes on and on, of frustration, disappointment. But yet we always know who we can turn to. And to be able to talk to Heavenly Father in prayer and, um, and listen to the Spirit of the Holy Ghost many times. And I only, I've, I've done it various times to where I ask Heavenly Father, who am I? Help me to remember. Help me never to forget where I came from. Why am I here? Where am I going? And, and you know, the three questions we used to, to do as missionaries. Why am I here? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? And I just sit here and I think, had I not known these things or had a direction to go in, I wouldn't be who I am today. But I love the hev my Heavenly Father and my Savior, Jesus Christ, and I love the prophets, and I love the B Book of Mormon, the scriptures. Those people wrote their lives down for us so that we could turn to it, even in our day and time, with questions that, that burden us, and we receive answers from them. And I just sit here and think, how could that be so not right? It's very peaceful. I think that's the peace and the unconditional love of our Heavenly Father, that he wants all his children, where any person, I tell my son, any person that hits the ground on this earth is loved so much. And if they could understand that, whether they're members of the church, whether whatever nationality they are or whatever, but more days we're all kind of all mixed together. But just remember you're a child of Heavenly Father. You're one of a kind. There's nobody else that's made like you. And so you be unique and be proud of who you are. Improve where you need to. Change is always good. I mean, repentance, that's my favorite thing. <laughs> that really is it's a blessing to me. Repentance is truly a blessing to me because I can correct my mistakes and move on. And I don't have to worry about it because the Savior already took care of it. If I'm willing to put the part in to repent and make myself whole again, I can walk in holy places. I can be who my Heavenly Father wants me to be. So, yeah, I love the gospel. <laughs> and um, I'm thankful for the, my family that I have, the experiences that I had on the placement program, the people that show me how much love they have for our Heavenly Father. I think that is, more importantly, the, the bottom line to this, is these people lived and walked the talk. And I was able to see that with my own high, my eyes and be able to feel it in my heart. And it's in ingrained in me it's in every fiber of my body and i know this to be true and i say it in the name of jesus christ amen amen thank you so today was kind of fun i got to substitute my 11 year old son's primary class I haven't taught primary for quite a few years, actually, so um, it's been since before Come Follow Me was it was the program, so this was the first time, and today was a fifth Sunday. Today, um, when I'm recording this, is June 30th, and so fifth Sunday, and in the Come Follow Me manual on, on my phone, when I opened it up to prepare the lesson, it said, there's this... There's this uh, appendix for fifth Sundays, and they it's it says to use one of the lessons in the appendix. So I did. Um, the one that I chose was about the priesthood power, and it it was really fun. So I put two headings on the board. One was God's power, and one was God's power and authority on the earth. And then there were some pictures that I used from the gospel. Uh, library, the, the art library, and, um, five of them were pictures of, of things that shows God's power. Like, he created the earth, and he is able to answer prayers, and 
um, when Jesus was on the earth, he healed the lepers. And anyway, so, and then there were four that showed, basically, they were ordinances. Um, I'm sure you could put some more under each one, but it was fun to talk with these children through how the the priesthood is used on the earth today. And it was fun to know, it was, I don't know if fun is the right word, it was incredible to know that the big things are, are in our future, are in our capabilities when we become gods and goddesses, like an earth, like being able to answer prayers, like it was, it was really cool. And I was just so thankful that I got to have this lesson with these children. It was super fast. I cannot believe how fast the lesson time is for primary kids. I I don't even know how teachers do that. Um, but I, I'm really grateful for the reminder of the priesthood. And I know in the, in the Come Follow Me lesson this week, we talked about Melchizedek and how he used his priesthood to bless the earth and to teach the people on the earth how to live the right way. I am just so grateful for the priesthood on the earth. I am grateful for prophets and for bishops and for my husband who holds the priesthood and can offer blessings in our home. I, I'm just so grateful for the priesthood and I just wanted to share that today because it was awesome and I'm thankful for it and I hope you have a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you. And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.